Good morning. My name is Wesley Hunt. I'm the pastor here at Bethesda Baptist Church. It's my distinguished privilege and honor to be with you again on His Word Lives Ministry. I would like to thank uh, my brother in Christ, uh, Brother David Guthrie, for his service to the Lord and his uh, kingdom vision to proclaim the gospel uh, beyond the walls of a building and beyond the limitations of our natural voices to be able to proclaim the gospel and pray for the lost and the saints around the world. And so uh, it is my privilege each time I have the opportunity to preach and to be a part of this ministry with His Word Lives. Uh, today, we're going to be in God's Word, and we're going to be in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. As we are reading from a text that is a part of the resurrection story of Jesus, we are excited in this season as we are still celebrating the resurrection. We never get tired of what it means to have a risen Savior. And as uh, the, the apostles in the first century church struggled with what it really meant to know that Jesus was alive, we realize that we're every day still trying to appreciate and trying to learn what it really means to serve a risen Savior. And to take that message to a world as Jesus gave us a great commandment and a commission to go to love others and to lead them to Jesus, uh, we continually as a church body, as a body of Christ beyond the walls of a building, we try to learn together what God's word says to us that is the most important thing. And so we'll honor God in reading his word from John's gospel, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. God's word reads that John recorded for us and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. As I have been a Christian for many years now, and as I have had the privilege of serving as a pastor for several years, one of the things that we realize is that sometimes we lose our focus and we begin to focus on things that are uh, really distractions in our life. They can be distractions for our congregation. Uh, they can be distractions that would lead lost people to stay lost. The good news about the good news is that the gospel of Jesus clarifies us for us what the most important things are. And the most important thing is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the word of God, the Bible, is given to us as a precious treasure to help constrain us and focus us as his people, as those who already believe in him, on what it really means and what we should really be doing. I want us to notice that uh, the Bible tells us the story of Jesus. Now, that may not be revelational to you, revelation, revolutionary to you, but it it needs to impact us today that this is God's word about God himself. And so understanding that, I want us to focus, first of all, on what the Bible does not say and what and what the Gospel of John specifically does not focus on. And I want to mention to you that the Bible does not focus on John. The Gospel of John does not focus on John. It's certainly as a, a man of God who was loved dearly by Jesus himself and followed him not from a distance, but very closely, God's word could certainly take us down a path where the writers of the Bible are magnified. We can have stories all about them and their likes and their dislikes and their hobbies. If we were writing a, a biography, we would not have uh, just a few pages. We would have a, a huge volume on someone like John himself or take the apostle Paul or, or Peter, we could write volumes and now in a modern library you could go and if you saw a, a biography of a president or a, a leader of a nation or even someone that we may have forgotten from the annals of time, you could find very thick volumes about these people and the minute things that they liked and disliked and hobbies and concerns. But when we see the scripture, we notice we don't have all of the writers of scripture man magnified in what the Holy Spirit led them to record. We also see that even as it concerns Christ, we don't have what we would consider to be a biography, every single thing he did. John was careful to note that many things that Jesus did are left out of his gospel. Many of the things 
that he did were not mentioned here, but are mentioned in other gospels. And so we find a composite and complete fullness of scripture that does not rely, rely upon even the Holy Spirit's speaking to one human being in a way that tells them everything we would ever need to know about Jesus. But we do have the complete revelation of Christ to us in the word of God. Not only is a, a complete biography not found here in John's gospel, but also we find that for those who seek simply to be curious and pious and religious, we find that they are never satisfied with the scriptures. We find that there are books and shelves full of speculations and conjecture and philosophical approaches to what religion ought to be for mankind. But what we understand is, is those books do not hold the hope of a life-changing relationship of Jesus Christ. It is the gospel that leaves out the curiosities and all the questions many times that people are enamored with and go through life searching for that do not matter. Those things are recorded in many other places, but it's in the scripture that we find the Bible constrains itself to the, the true focus, which is what's most important for us, and that is how we can have an eternal, saving relationship with Jesus Christ. We also find that for those who are looking for a life book that addresses every single possible question they may have or circumstance they might find themselves, we don't have all the examples that we could ever come up with. Sometimes people say, well, what does the Bible say about this specific thing? And when we look at it, we don't find that particular life problem or that particular life circumstance. Don't misunderstand me. I believe the Bible applies to every circumstance of life. But some people would like to say, well, Jesus lived as a great example. Well, what we understand is we don't have every example that of, of possible nature found in the Bible. We don't have every recorded instance of the things that Jesus did. The Bible records for us that John said that many other signs were done in the presence of the apostles. Later on, we find out that it is said that if all the things that Jesus did were recorded, that all the book, books in all the world would not hold the volume and the weight and the implication of all the things that Jesus did. And so we understand that first of all, in the life of John, in the life of the writers of the gospel, there, there is restraint. And I want us to even understand that many times in our life, there needs to be restraint in the telling of the gospel. Because as a pastor, as a preacher, as Brother David, as a minister on the, on the internet, as you and your life, in your home, in your job, you could chase every rabbit. You've, you've heard some of us preachers chase a rabbit for a while, and we kind of get lost sometimes in the briars of life. We get lost in the telling of our story. Our story can become about ourselves. Our, our illustrations can become fanciful. Our ideas and our concerns can become so minute that we miss what the gospel is really about. And so as we look at what John said, inspired by the Holy Spirit, I want us to understand that there is restraint and the telling of the story of Jesus. We're not here today to, to tell you to be Baptist. We're not here today to tell you to be American or Democratic. What we're here to do today is to tell you that these things have been written so that you may know that you have a life-changing, personal, saving relationship because of the finished atoning work of Jesus on the cross and the empty tomb and an ongoing intercession, you can find that relationship. And that is what is recorded in these pages of history and these pages of the gospel because the signs are real. The restraint of the story keeps us from chasing all of our fancies and answering all of your curiosities sometimes. But the reality of the signs says that what we preach to you is in fact true. What happens and is recorded in these pages, every word of it, every example of it, every miracle, every message, every ministry that is mentioned in these pages is God's divine, inspired, infallible word conveyed to us conveyed through us to the world so that we can live based upon it. Not thinking it might be so or hoping it would be so. This is not a myth. We're not preaching to you fable and fancies. We're preaching you today the word of God that is able to point you to the one who can change your life. The reality of these signs there were real signs that happened that aren't here. There have been things that have happened in my life and in your life and other people's life that we, like the first century apostles, would say we just can't help but tell of the things that we've seen and heard. 
But the main thing that we need to make sure we don't fail to tell is that Jesus Christ saves. Not only are these real signs, these are recorded for us that they would be read. Now, sometimes we lose fact, lose sight of the fact that the Bible is written. That means it's a word. And that means that we need to turn around and take what's written and read it. And I don't apologize today for being very simple, but I want you to understand that when we read what was written, it becomes spoken. I believe there's something powerful about reading the Word of God out loud. I believe there's something very powerful and biblical. The Bible tells us in, in, the, God, in the New Testament in Romans that when we preach the Word of God, there's a power that takes place that is not because the pastor knows a lot of words or even deep theology or great philosophy or is a master of psychology. There's a power that comes when the Word of God is read and spoken and preached and it is the power of God unto salvation for the Jew first and then for the Gentile and praise God that the gospel now has gone to the ends of the earth and is going to the ends of the earth in just a few weeks I will have the privilege of going again on on a, a trip outside of the country and being a couple different African nations and we'll be able to preach the gospel and and the first time I ever did that I was concerned and, and I'll be concerned this time I, we always have fleshly worries but one of the things that God has done to comfort and encourage and prepare me is to realize that the same gospel that preaches in Calhoun Georgia is the same gospel that should be preached around the world we don't need a different way we don't need a different message we need to be the same messenger messengers of God because we say thus says the Lord and John knew that we would need that John knew we'd need that in Calhoun, Georgia, or anywhere else we find ourselves on this globe. These things are written, he says in verse 31, not that everything can be known and every curiosity can be satisfied. These things are written, listen, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. So I want to mention to you that John constrained and restrained himself, but I want you to know that Jesus Christ provided himself as the reason for the story. We, we restrain ourselves and constrain ourselves to this gospel. Jesus Christ came that he might be the reason for the gospel. It is written because Jesus Christ is God's answer for what plagues mankind. The Bible is very clear from the very beginning to the very end of the scriptures that the greatest problem that you have and that I have is the fact that we are sinners that we fall from God's grace and from God's, from God's satisfaction because of our sin. We have fallen from our right relationship with him for which he intends for us to have, for which he desires for us to have. But in our fallen state, the Bible says it's our sin that separates us and that none are righteous. And that means, that means I'm not righteous and it means that you're not righteous. None are righteous, no, not one. So, if you're out there and you think, well, no, I'm the one, you need to know the Bible says that there are none who are righteous. And you say, well, I didn't used to be righteous, but I've learned how to be. Well, I don't know if you think you educated well enough or uh, advanced high enough or earned enough, but the Bible says that even our righteousness is as filthy rags. So you may be better than your neighbor or you think you are or better than someone that lives somewhere else, but the Bad news, and there has to be bad news if we're going to understand there's good news. The bad news is that we have all sinned. And the wage and the payment for sin is death. So that's a harsh judgment. It is, but it's a fair judgment. Because sin is an abomination before God. Sin separates us from God because God is holy and pure and perfect and without sin in any way. And yet we are irreparably sinned on our own, sinful on our own, because we have sinned by nature and by choice. And the Bible, God's word contains those truths. Those are the truths that are written in the pages of the Old Testament and New Testament that we are all sinners. And that is a sad state of affairs. And it would be so terribly and eternally sad, except for the good news that the Bible says that while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. The story of the Bible, written so that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, says that God, because we could not, 
God, because we would not, God did become a man. The God-man, Jesus Christ. He became Emmanuel, God with us, and God for us. And the Bible says he lived as man, yet without sin. And so in his perfection, he has attained and proven forth the righteous requirements of God. And the Bible tells us that he died on a cross, not because he was, he was captured and forced to be there, in the eyes of man, it may have looked that way. But in the eternal will of God, he was offered as a ransom, a sacrifice for the sin of the world. That in Christ Jesus, in his bodily sacrifice, he paid an atoning price. He paid for my sin. He paid for your sin. And by his stripes, we are healed. He bore the iniquity of of us all. He hung on a cross between two thieves, two men who deserved to be there, but he desired to be there. He desired to fulfill the will of God, expressed that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm just simply here today to tell you the Bible restrains us from all sorts of nonsense so that Jesus can tell us the reason he came to this earth. And he came to this earth to die for us, not so his death would be meaningless. To die for us, as it says here, so that we may believe. In the very first chapter of the Gospel of John, John himself tells us that to as many as would believe in him, to as many as will receive him, to them he gives the right to become the children of God. And I want to ask you today, have you reached a point and a place and a time in your life where you have understood that this is the story of Jesus, that Jesus Christ loves you, that he loves me. He loves you in an everlasting way, a way that he proved as he struck, stretched out his hands on a cruel cross of sacrifice and he paid your sin penalty and he paid my sin penalty. For those who would receive him, to those who would believe in him, not believe about him. It, it's very rare to run into somebody who just says, I don't ever believe anybody named Jesus ever lived. And a lot of times where we live, it's rare to run into somebody who would say that I don't believe that Jesus is God's son or that I don't believe that he died on the cross for my sin. But the Bible was not written so that we would simply believe. The Bible was written so that believing in Jesus as the Christ and the Son of God, you may have life in his name. That's what we call saving faith. It's not a cognitive understanding. It's, it's not just an emotion. Many people, if not most people that we live around in this part of the world, have a cognitive intellectual assent to the fact that Jesus is existed or Jesus lived or that Jesus may be God's son. Some even have an emotional response to say, yes, I feel like that's true. But there is a faith offered to us through the grace of Jesus Christ recorded for us in the scriptures here in the gospel of John that the Bible was written. Scripture has been given. Jesus died, rose again, and intercedes now so that if we will believe upon him, that he's the Christ, that he's the son of God, that we may have life in his name. So that becomes the question. We notice John restrained himself from chasing every other thing. And we notice that Jesus has a clear scriptural reason that he came. And so we, we near the end today and, and we want to ask us, well, what about us? What is our reward? Well, the Bible says the judgment will come for all mankind. Every single person, every man, woman, boy, and girl, it's recorded in the New Testament that life is like a vapor. It's just here briefly and then it's gone. Here yet for a little while and, and it goes away. And every person will stand before God in judgment because after life is the judgment. And you say, well, you said there's a reward. Well, there is. There's a reward for everybody. We're either going to receive the reward based upon 
our flesh and how we lived and what we could do and what we could attain, which we've already mentioned from the scriptures, is sin and death and eternal condemnation. Jesus didn't come to condemn us. Jesus came because we were already under condemnation. We were already under eternal judgment because of our utter lack and our utter inability to accomplish the righteousness of God. It is not within us. And so without Christ, without the Bible story, the truth, the fact that Jesus Christ truly came, he truly lived without sin. He truly died. He didn't faint or pass out. He died. He was dead, but he rose again. They didn't take his life. He freely laid it down because he alone had the power to take it up again. And as he did so, he was seen and testified and miracles took place. And many people said that is the resurrected Jesus. And he ascended to the right hand of the Father where even now he intercedes for those who will come through his blood by his name and saving, believing faith and come to him. And the question is, are we going to remain in our sin and receive the reward for our iniquity and our righteousness? Or will we, in fact, come as Jesus beckons and calls us to come and come by faith? Prior to these verses in John's gospel, we see one of the closest followers of Jesus, one of the apostles, one of the 12, which became 11 after Judas betrayed Jesus, Thomas had missed out. Some of you may have missed out until now. The good news is when Thomas missed out, the disciples were still meeting. They were struggling. They, we, we, we're all, even those who are saved, we struggle sometimes. We, we, we get frail. The disciples were following and they were still frail, but they were meeting and they were gathering and they were telling what they'd seen. But Thomas wasn't there. Good news was they met again. And by the way, if you're, if you're a Christian, you just need to keep meeting. Because the more often you meet, the more times there's an opportunity for a Thomas to show up. And Thomas was there the next time. Jesus appeared and Thomas wasn't there. And then they gathered and Thomas was there, and Jesus didn't appear. But see, they, 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 those who were there already had seen the resurrected Jesus. So they could tell Thomas, it's great. And Thomas said, I'll not believe unless I see. And the third time in those few verses, then they gathered again, and Thomas was there, and then Jesus showed up. And Jesus showed Thomas his hands and his side. And Thomas being beckoned to reach and see the proof. The Bible actually doesn't record that Thomas ever actually touched Jesus. Just being asked to touch Jesus, Thomas says, my Lord and my God. We see a faith response, a, a movement not just of his mind, not just of his emotion, but of his will to acknowledge, notice the Lordship and the Messiahship and the Sonship of Jesus Christ. My Lord and my God. Both who God was in relation as a Messiah and also who he was as a reigning Lord. And Jesus said, Thomas, you're blessed. You're blessed because you've seen me. Notice what Jesus said. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. There is a great scriptural, biblical blessing promised to you if you will hear the word of God. Receive the preaching of the Holy Spirit. Let it take lodging place in your heart and not just simply receive it intellectually or emotionally, but to receive it spiritually. Because it's in the spirit that spiritual things are discerned that you might have life, believing in him with your life, surrendering to him, admitting your sin, calling upon him, turning and repenting from your sin, receiving Jesus Christ. There's a reward there, a reward that Brother David lives in and that I live in and many in our church and, and many that you may know that live in a reward and that reward is that you may have life in his name. We don't have life because we're born in a certain country or speak a certain language or earn an amount of money or live in a certain neighborhood. We have life in the name of Jesus Christ. Again, in John's gospel, Jesus continued to teach in his earthly ministry that I am the way and the truth and the life. 
He also said that to Thomas. <laughs> See, some people need to hear it and hear it and hear it again. And, and if you're here today and you're a Christian, I want you to remember that, that for people like Thomas who need to hear it and hear it and hear it again, what is it they need to hear? They need to hear the word of God. They don't need to hear the pastor thinks or the church says. What they need to hear is thus saith the Lord. Because it was this same Jesus at a funeral that said, I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, you will never die. The story of Jesus is a story of life for those who believe in him. If you're here today and you don't know him, I want to ask you at this point in time to open your heart to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Open your mind to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Open your soul and your spirit and call upon him. He tells us if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, we can be saved. Your life can be changed. Your eternity will be set in a different way. I'm not just talking about life where we keep living. I read this morning in the news of someone who had received a sentence of prison for life. Say, so, well, at least they're alive. Well, they're alive, but they're in prison. I want you to know today that Jesus doesn't promise you a life in prison. Jesus promises you today life that's eternal. And life, as he also says earlier in the Gospel of John in the 10th chapter, that is abundant and full and overflowing. See, the life that Jesus offers is not just a duration, but it's a quality of life different than any other quality of life that's available anywhere. So many people say, well, I, I don't want to follow Christ because it's going to ruin my life. Listen, your life is already ruined without Jesus. But because the blessed hope of God's word, this story is written so that you may believe. Not so that you can sit around and feel good in this life only, or not so you can be miserable in this life and hopefully feel better later. This story is written so that you might have life and have it more abundantly because this is the story of Jesus, the story of God's anointed Messiah, the Christ who came to be both sacrifice and sacrifice giver to be the one who created and also to be the one who was present at the redemption of his creation and the culmination of time as we know it. And he will reign forever. And the Bible tells us at the day of reward, there'll be a day where every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, to the glory of God the Father. I want to ask you, I want to encourage you to hear the word, receive it spiritually, and let it change you eternally. And that is my prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. Thank you for an opportunity to preach your gospel, your story. Lord, we thank you that it's not ours by design, but Lord, Lord, we thank you that it can be our story by divine appointment, <laughs> that you bless us with an opportunity to believe in you. And Lord, I thank you that your story is now my story. It's my story to live in that life, but it's also my story to proclaim. Proclaim its availability because of your love and your grace. If we will extend and reach forward by faith and receive it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.